Right, hi everyone, welcome to Alitex. This is the Alitex Orchid Talk. Uh, we are at the beginning of May, May the something or other, what is it? Sixth. May the sixth, thank okay. you. Um, what we've done here, we just sort of brought a selection of plants along, and we're going to talk about the plants, and we're also going to add uh, things like bits of potting and that sort of thing at the end, just to sort of uh, really cover all the bases, really. Um, do you, those who don't know me, I'm Jim. I've been at Monk Beans now for just under 50 years, July the 1st, in fact. So I won't retire then. And so I will be handing the reins over to Ellie. Okay, so Ellie will be in charge. Um, I'm not giving up orchids entirely. I'm still there, sort of hanging on as a sort of a consultant. Um, I'm also involved with another one here, which is the May the Foundation, which is a new orchid foundation. So it's not a commercial thing, so it's not like Monk Beans at all. Uh, where we're just sort of growing uh, species and making new hybrids and we've got a sort of a conjunction with some property over in Colombia so it's a slightly different thing but so I'll show you around but Ellie's the one she's Miss McBean okay. right. <laughs> so okay what I'm gonna do is pick up a few plants um, can I have the lovely aim behind you yes. please? right this is a cymbidium now cymbidiums are cool growing plants from the sort of Himalayas northern India this is a very special one though. This is Loiana Magnificum McBeans, okay? This has been to every single Chelsea flower show that we've been to. Um, in fact, we reckon it went to the sh two shows preceding before the uh, Chelsea flower show. Um, so it's, we've had it on the nursery now for 121 years. Uh, we just sort of cut the back off every now and then. But they're a cool growing plant. Um, so this is a species, as it's sort of you'd find in the wild. And from there we sort of breed, you can see there's another one there, and then we just breed bigger and bigger and bigger until we get to, where's me? Oh, the one's down the front. See the sort of the, yeah. what, the yellow ones, etc. the front. So that's sort of more like the modern take on this. Having said that, there's been a lot of interest now. The trend is to go back from the modern hybrid to the really old fashioned species. They're much nicer, they're much daintier. So we've got two or three little fine ones here, you can see. So that's the trend really. We're sort of undoing a lot of the last 100 years breeding in effect, going back to smaller, dainty little plants. Um, now long season, we start off flowering our cymbidiums about November, and obviously we've still got some now. We try and keep some for Chelsea, what would normally be Chelsea, you know, the end of, the end of May time. Obviously we're not gonna have anything this year, um, so we won't be going to the show, unfortunately. So um, that's about the only two years, I think, two or three years we've missed in all of the Chelsea's. And I say, this has been to every single one. So it's a famous little plant. Um, so cymbidiums are cool growing, we keep them just frost free, about well 8 degrees preferably if you can at night, and a day temperature of about 14, 15, but they must go out in the garden through the summertime. Um, if you can avoid really bright sunlight, put them on the sort of a shade of a tree, the north side of a tree, uh, so they've got a dapple shade really. Um, water them obviously preferably with rainwater and a bit of feed, Ellie will talk about feed later on. Um, it's going to be an orchid feed, don't use any old feed. Water sparingly, so when it's dry, you chuck a bit of water on it. You can leave them out right through the summer till about frost time, really, which is nowadays is probably November, to be honest. Then bring them in the house somewhere cool. They'll be in spike at that time, and they'll grow up and flower right through the season. So cool growing. Um, even when they're in your house, they want somewhere cool. The living room's too hot. You want a sort of a cool growing um, conservatory or a even just sort of an unheated room is preferable. They've still got to know it's winter, although it's got to be frost free basically. So very, very tough plants. So say this one's 121 years old, and I think we've got a couple of old ones at the nursery, haven't we? So they, they'll come on for ages. And these never fail, you know, these flower every year. Um, they're quite impressive. In fact, one of these, or very similar to this, one of the things that got me into orchids actually, my granddad had one of these. Um, under the bench in his conservatory, and when it in flower, he used to have a, a buttonhole but a flower every single day until the whole spike had gone. So there you go, there's a bit of history. Isn't it? <laughs> right, so that's the cymbidiums. So that's the cool end. We'll now jump to the other end. Um, we've got a fally there. Yes. Right, now you'll all know these. These are the phalaenopsis, if you like. These are the weed of the orchid world. Um, they're absolutely everywhere, you, know, you can buy them in supermarkets, petrol stations and God knows where else to be honest. Um, they are cheap, in fact they're a bit too cheap now. Um, you see plants that have got horrible yellow marks on the leaves because they've grown to fit the price they're going to get in effect. They come down in value so much but the quality's dropped with it. 
Now these are warm growing, yeah? The last all we seen was up in the Himalaya. This is a tropical plant, it comes from the tropical jungles. They grow up a tree, but they grow at that angle, yeah? So they grow at sort of 45 degree. Now the reason for this is they're in sort of really wet conditions, but the plant doesn't want to stay wet. So if you look at the guttering of the leaf, it's all designed to get rid of the water. So the water runs down the bark of the host tree, where it gets nutrients from, but this leaf work is all designed to get water away from the center. Now we muck up probably 50 million years of evolution and go out the wrong way, i.e. we grow that, that way up. And of course, if you water this now, water will sit in there, and that's the very last thing it wants. It's designed to get rid of it, now it collects it in effect. So we always water from the top, but avoid any water sitting in that apex, yeah? Just tip, tip it over, let it out, something like that. These are grown in transparent pots. In fact, we're gonna pop one later on. Um, this is because it's a real epiphyte. The upper tree and all these roots um, will be exposed. And they make these aerial roots, which is a secondary root system. See this sort of silvery root? This is the root that follows the light. It actually goes round the host tree. So it cuddles itself to a tree using these aerial roots. Um, and these look for light. So if you grow these in a normal plastic solid pot, the roots will often make loads and loads of these aerial roots. But by having the transparent pot, it lets light in, so it retains most of the roots within the pot. Okay. Plus you can see how good your root system is, to be honest. But they like to be pot bound, as you can see. And these are growing in a very open bark mix. But Ellie will discuss all this sort of thing later on. Um, these are an amazing pot plant. They just happen to like our temperatures. You know, we tend to grow in houses, we live rather in houses, sort of around 20 degrees, which is perfect for these things. It can be a bit dry sometimes, so it may be worth growing them on a bit of gravel, like we've got on the benching here. Just some of this sort of uh, gravel and stuff, which can just keep slightly moist. That solves the humidity. And again, preferably rainwater. Mm. Um, I know it's a bit of a fuss if you're living in a, I know, a, flat in the middle of London. You just got to run out with a bucket when it's raining or something and collect it. Um, but they're so good. They'll last three or four months in flower. In fact, I think they last a bit too long. You can get a bit sick of the sight of them after a while, to be honest. But when they do start to finish, when they start to go a bit papery, then that's the time to cut the spike. And what we do, we count three nodes, and the nodes are these little lumps. Can you see them go like the spike here? We count three from the base. So there's one there, one there, one there. So we would cut that just above that point, And then the plant should branch and flower from that within about three or four months if your conditions are good. So again, not too much sunlight. You want to be in a room, but not on a south facing window. Water sparingly with a bit of rainwater and orchid feed. Um, and they're amazing things, they really are. Just be careful when you buy them now. The very cheap ones are not as good quality. You know, you only have one spot rather than two and um, you get streaking in the uh, in the leaves. Or anything. But, very easy to do, and we'll Ellie will do some potting later on just to show you uh, how to pot these off. Right, I'm now going to move on to these feathers. Now, these are my favourite. This is the thing that we specialise at the Moth Foundation, is the Oncidiums. But these are special Oncidiums. These all had a different name. These were called Dontoglossums until a few years ago. And in fact, there's now um, a bit of a trend trying to get them back into Dontoglossums. They're very specialist growing. Um, they actually grow in the cloud forests of um, Colombia, Peru, um, Ecuador. So they like it sort of dark, dingy, a normal summer's day. <laughs> they grow in a bit hot, really sort of very, very heavy shade, very high humidity, loads of moisture in the air. Yeah. So they're a bit, it's almost anti-growing really. We do opposite with most plants. So these are a bit more specific. Um, they say so that the high altitude plants, they like it fairly chilly as well. So our summers, the last two summers, have been far too hot for them. They've actually really, really objected to it. In fact, we're fitting a cooling system now in the greenhouses to get the temperatures down to fit these temperatures because it's just too much for them. Um, they're a lovely group of plants. They don't grow a bit too big, as you can see. Um, and these are actually growing, again, Ellie will pick up this later on, these are actually growing in a moss. Yeah, and so it's, it's um, perlite and uh, rock quartz and these particular ones. And they seem to like that all the time because it's um, nice, it holds a bit of moisture, not too wet, but it's just slightly damp. That's what we're after with these things. So these, a little bit trickier. These are probably the most tricky of the lot, to be honest. High shading right the way through the summer, a nighttime temperature of about 10 or 12 degrees, 
But the clever thing of these is try not let the summer temperature go above 25, 26 degrees. Now that sounds easy, but when we had, what, 35 yes. last year outside, trying to keep a greenhouse down to 25 is very, very difficult. So a little bit more specialist, but they're by far the most colorful. Um, this is an albino version. Um, and this country, um, well, along with sort of France and a bit of Europe, I suppose, we raided the forests for these, right through Colombia especially. They were bringing back shipments of about 10 to 20,000 plants at a time. And they wrote record only about 1% would actually survive. Okay, so these are actually hybrids. This is a species. I don't know if they'll actually show up on that. So that's the sort of, that's the species we were, we were collecting in the 1940s. 1947 was about the main time they started coming through. So that's the species that was collected and these are the hybrids that have been bred from since all that, you know, 140 odd years breeding, to be honest. But you can argue again that we're getting, just as the cymbidium, they're getting a bit too round, they're getting a bit too blobby, so we're unbreeding these again. So we're actually putting some of the modern hybrids right back to these tiny little species, okay, to give us a more sort of, a bit more user-friendly. Humans have got this terrible trait, we do it with dogs and everything, basically. We try and make things big, round and symmetrical. So you end up, you know, like a pug or whatever it is. Um, it's great to a point, but when you get to the point that you, you've lost the charm of what you're after, you know, you might as well grow, I don't know, poinsettias or whatever it is. We're trying to keep an orchid to look like an orchid. In fact, we'll pick up on that next, that next thing. Um, so we, we, we go, make everything more delicate, basically. It, one, it's got to be easy, easy to grow, obviously. It's got to be easy to flower. Um, so they're the main things, to be honest. It's, you have the most beautiful looking orchid in the world, but it only flowers every five years. It's a waste of time. So that bit comes in the breeding before what the actual flower looks like. What the flower looks like is about number three or four in the breeding line. It mustn't be too tall, so you can get two layers on a Danish trolley. There's loads of things you think about for a commercial plant. So that's the odontoglossums, or oncidiums as we're calling them. Well, I'll just pick up one more species, one more genus to have a look at, and then I'll pass over to Ellie. Um, now these are one of my favourites. These are um, Milton, Miltonia or Miltonopsis. Um, originally named after Viscount Milton, I think I'm right to say. Um, now these are a very, very soft growth. Most orchid leaves are as tough as old boots, but these have a very soft leaf. And you can see they put up a huge flower area. They can have more flower area than leaf area. So when they flower, they, they lose so much moisture from the flowers that it often emaciates the plant. So these are often one-hit wonders, i.e. they're flowering, you'll never see them flowering again. So what we're trying to do is to make these a much tougher plant. Now these will cross with the Odontoglossum family we were looking at, but not very readily, but they will do it. Um, but if we can toughen them up, if we can double up the chromosomes within the leaf, we'll make a stronger plant, so hopefully much, much longer, longer lasting. So that one to look out for. Um, they're probably the most colourful of all the orchids, and they have a perfume. Mm. So very few orchids have a perfume, and it's literally, I think it's 4% of all orchids have a perfume. They just rely on being a bit blousy, you know, to attract insects. But let's just pick up on a, what is an orchid, right. So these are all orchids, yeah, but whichever one you look at, they're all orchids. It's by far the biggest plant family on this planet. Um, there's between 30 and 31,000 species, yeah. One in 10 genera, that's one in 10 family groups of plants on this planet is an orchid, okay? They are absolutely everywhere. We're on the South Downs here, there are millions of orchids. I mean, they're often little things, you can hardly see them, but they're there, okay. <laughs> but they all follow the same pattern. So this is an orchid, this is a cymbidium orchid. This is, what is this one, Ellie? It's P.G. Woodhouse. P.G. Woodhouse, there yeah. we go. I <laughs> named loads of plants after P.G. Woodhouse and all these, um, all these sort of little people like... Um, characters. Yeah, that's all my characters, that's right, thank you for the intro. But every orchid follows this configuration, so you've got a sepal there, okay, two more petals there, two more sepals there, and the lip is in fact reformed petals. Now, every orchid will follow that line. Where's the little most of earlier? You got oh, that here? Oh, yes. okay. So that has it, that has it, that has it, and believe it or not, that has it. 
Now, you think he's talking rubbish here, but that is actually the petals are microscopic, so they are there. So when they do this sort of plant analysis, now what is your plant? You start off with the shape, and if it's got this configuration, it's immediately an orchid, okay? That's the first bit. The second bit is, um, you can't get hay feed from an orchid. Mm -hmm. There's no free pollen. It's always in sticky, excuse me, <laughs> it's always in a sticky bundles, okay? Um, in this case, it's a, a bee, a bit like our bumblebee, a Himalayan bee. The whole flower's obviously designed for different insects, but this one is for a bee, and you can see it's got this sprung-loaded lip, it bounces up and down. And if you can see, there's two sort of yellowy bits there. That's actually the landing platform. And then there's some lines going down the throat of the flower, and they're indicators telling the bee where the, where the food is, basically. So we'll assume my little finger's a bee. He'll land on the landing platform, You'll go down the flower to have a drink, and as it comes back up, the lip pushes into the top of the flower, and it'll automatically fly off with a pollen on his head. So there. We'll do a close-up of that later on, I'm sure. <laughs> so there we are. So we've got this bee whizzing around the Andes with these little dealy bobbers on his head, yeah. He'll fly into another flower and have a drink, and as he comes back up again, the lip will push him to the top of the flower, and the pollen there is gone, you see? It's actually captured by the female bit of the flower. Now this is because the anther, the female bit, is twice as sticky as the glue holding it onto the bee's head, okay? So that's now pollinated, and then the pollen grains go down the back of the flower into this bit, and this will swell up to be a, a seed pod. Um, and you can have thousands of seeds, 20, 30,000 seeds in a seed pod. And in fact, I'll pass it earlier, I'll show you these in a second. Yeah. But, so every orchid, even if you're walking around and you see something out in the downs here or wherever, check the pollen. If it's got sticky pollen, um, then that's probably an orchid. People come in to, especially with beans there, start sneezing. Yes. Because exactly. they see the flowers, the hay fever. Absolutely nothing to do with our flowers. It's purely psychosomatic. Um, these um, orchids are Dendrobium, Kinianum, Berry. Um, we have uh, just the Kinianums, which are white and sometimes are very light pink, but this one is a um, very dark pink, which is very nice, and it, it has these canes, um, which are called pseudobulbs. Um, yeah, that's about it for that one. And sometimes these have a scent. If it's very warm, um, you do have a scent. And like Jim said earlier, there aren't many orchids that do have a scent, so that's quite unusual and it's quite lovely. It has a lovely profusion of flowers, which is very nice. And on this plant, actually, we have a little thing called a kiki, where you can take, twist it off, it's created some little roots we get these questions all the time about what are these they're kikis and here we go it's all twisted here we go as you can see there's some little roots in there if you pop that in some bark or some sphagnum moss like we have here you create a whole other plant so yeah these are great for that and they, they do really well. I mean, you can't you really cannot kill these. Um, they like temperatures up to 20. They're very um, tolerant of all sorts of temperatures. And again, like all the orchids, rainwater and orchid feed, um, definitely a must. So that's that one. Um, and then this one, this is really weird, lovely and cool. Um, I really like these, uh, Jim doesn't. <laughs> it's a Paphipidillium. Um, it's a little slipper orchid, that's the common name for it, and it has this big old dorsal fin um, petal here, and then these two uh, petals, and then the, the distinctive pouch here. Um, usually, I can't see on this one, but usually there's like a little green fly that looks like a green fly, and it attracts uh, pollinators, and they drop into this pouch, and then they have to come up the top here, and it takes the pollen out there and zooms off to another plant. Um, so in the summer, sometimes we get little, little wasps and things stuck here, actually, because it's like they can't actually fly out because it's a little bit sticky, so they have to crawl out. So, um, yeah, that's quite cool. And we had um, you can get the mottled leaf ones, like this one, which is slightly hotter growing, or the um, plain leaf ones, which are slightly cooler, but we're talking sort of um, more for good um, temperatures, so 20, something like that. So that's that one. And then this one is a zygopetalum. Um, this one, another one with a scent. I know we said we don't have many scented orchids, but we have a few here. <laughs> 
Um, these are lovely again in the in the sun, really scented, and when you've got a lot of them, it's quite it's quite a lot um, of the scent. Anyway, these um, have the bulbs a bit like the, the oncidiums and the cymbidiums. So these are all um, compared to the path, as you can see, no bulbs there. So they grow upwards. They keep putting on growth upwards or outwards here. Whereas these ones move along. So it has one bulb here and I keep moving along and along and along. And that's basically food storage there. Um, a lot of customers say, what, what should I do with these bulbs? They're dead. They're not dead. They are storage. They're still fueling the plant. So um, don't cut them off unless they start getting a little bit condensed. And then, well, we'll go through that early, um, later. I've got one that definitely needs cutting up and you'll see what I mean by it gets a bit too compacted. So yeah, that's that. So we get a lot of um, customers asking about how and uh, when to water. Um, it's quite difficult to say, it's depending on the orchid and the orchid pot size and everything like that. But you never want to overwater an orchid, that's what kills them off. Most orchids get overwatered, um, you're much better underwatering them. Um, usually you can tell, so when you water, just um, once you water, pick up and feel how heavy that pot is once you've watered it. And then pick it up like, I don't know, a few days later, maybe a week later, see how light that is, if it's very light compared to when you picked it up when it was wet, um, give it another water. Um, sometimes as well, uh, it looks wet on top, but it's not, um, and underneath it's very wet, so that's another difficult one. And that's a little bit easier with the um, transparent pots then as well, you can also see when they do need watering, um, um, it'll look very dry, um, and these actually don't mind drying out, definitely leave them to dry out rather than over water. Um, with watering, um, we use rainwater, or if you don't have any rainwater, distilled water, um, there's too many things in our tap water and they don't like it basically um, and also with watering you do need to feed um, we do a spring and summer feed and an autumn and winter um, the spring and summer is basically based on growing new green growth um, as our most orchids are winter flowering anyway and then the autumn winter is um, for encouraging um, flower growth um, and on, well, on most of the orchid, it has to be orchid feed, by the way, um, any sort of Tom Wright or Baby Bio is way too strong for orchids. They have to, um, it's a very small amount. So on here it says uh, one teaspoon, so five millilitres of water to two litres of water. So it's hardly anything. So that's, you're gonna, that's gonna last you. If you only have a few orchids, that'll last you for a year or two. Um, what else should I say? Mm -mm -mm. Oh yeah, sorry, frequency of feeding, that's what I was going to go into. So um, we actually, will, um, we feed every time we water in the nursery, but we do recommend giving a good flush out with some rainwater, because otherwise it's sort of build up in the roots and you don't want that, otherwise it starts dumping all the um, nutrients onto the roots and they won't like that. So yeah, that's feeding and watering. So um, we're going to have a go at splitting a Cymbidium orchid. As you can see, it's got a bit beastly, a bit big. So. Um, and also in the middle there, it looks like they're dead bulbs. They're not dead, they're still there, they're still being used. They're basically food storage, but it's got a bit compacted and we want a bit more green growth, basically, green bulbs. So um, Jim helpfully split this earlier and I'm just gonna take out the piece that he's done and we'll move the other bit over, so yeah. Basically, you don't want to be, we use knives basically, um, you don't want to be too gentle with them, they don't mind being cut up. So there we go, there's two splittings, we're just going to deal with this one, um, and then you can probably get another two, possibly three splittings out of that one. Oh, but I'll put that one down here. So we're just going to tidy up the roots here. So all this root belongs to all of that bit of plant. So we need to get rid of it. We just basically want this side of the plant. This is the leading growth, basically. Um, don't think we have any new growth on this bit, but they will start putting up new growth. And from the new growth, a bulb will come. Um, and then by the winter, um, hopefully, a flower will come from that bulb. So I'm just gonna go through the middle here. Their plants, but you just got to do it. <laughs> so 
So that's all old, old root we don't need. I'm just going to get a bit of this side off as well. Okay. Oh, there's a bit of new growth there. So a bit of new growth there, that will become a bulb. And then put on, that's the roots we're most concerned with. So, even some of this can come off. There we go. So we're going to pop that. Also, um, as you can see, some of these leaves are starting to go yellow. They're just dropping off. That's quite normal for a cymbidium. People, wait, again, get worried. I'm going to take them off early. And not, nothing to worry about. So um, these, I've got a couple of pots here, because they're the right size. Basically, we don't want to overpot these. They want to go into a pot that's smaller than you think it should go into. So um, it's a bit too small. But this one, yeah, that's about right. Now it's a little bit small, but that's perfect. And um, that's what we want. Because if you overpot them, you're more prone to overwatering them. And they prefer to be pot bound, to be honest. So I'm going to take some of these old bits as well. Just to tidy it up a bit. All the old bracts. Um, and this compost is a mix um, that we make ourselves on the beans. It's got peat, uh, bark and perlite, and some other trace elements like feed, lime, a bit of calcium, um, polymite. Um, you can, I know peat is obviously a bit of a funny subject. No one really wants to use it anymore. We do try and limit it. In fact, we've added more bark to our mix now because of that very reason. You can use straight bark or you can use rock wool, which is here. Which Jim's going to talk about a little bit, but it's basically just um, like insulation. Um, it holds moisture well, but it also gives good space for the roots. So we're just going to do this. And you don't want to put too much, um, you want to compact it completely in. I know it doesn't look like it has many roots, but um, by doing this, we're sort of encouraging it to put on new roots onto the new growth. Just lightly tamper it down. And it's a little bit difficult uh, when it feels like it's very full with the top growth. There we go. And sometimes they're a little bit top heavy, but um, that's how they like it. So there's one splitting, and then we've probably got three or four splittings from that other one. And give that a good water, just plain rainwater. Um, no feed for two months, just to encourage it to uh, make a good root in here. You're basically starving it uh, to go and look for food. Um, but then after that, two months, you start feeding it. So that's, that's one done. Right, so um, we don't always have to split um, cymbidiums. This one is pretty happy. Um, it could probably actually even stay in that pot for another year. It would, would be fine. But it's getting a bit top heavy and no one's going to really buy that when it's like that. They're going to want it nicely potted and easy to look after. So we're just going to pot it up one. So I'm just going to cut the um, pot off because it's so pot bound. As you can see, it's got an amazing root there, really lovely. We don't really want to upset that because that's really nice. And we've got lots of nice green bulbs here and new growth coming off all areas of that. Eventually, when it gets too big, when it gets to that big BC one we saw earlier, we would split it. But now we're just going to pot it up into only one size up. So I know that doesn't look very potted enough, but it is. That's plenty of room. So again, we're going to use this peat compost um, with bark. It's very open. Um, you don't want to use just normal potting compost. It's, um, the, the roots just won't like it. Again, they'll just get way too wet. Let's just take that in. Again, not too compact again, just slightly so it's got some air for the roots. Just do this side. And lots of people 
people ask us how long they can stay in their pots for, um, how often is usually really repot them. We say up to two, three years for cypidiums. Um, and with the fan ops, it's just a little bit sooner, probably two years, um, just to refresh the compost, basically. Right, that looks okay to me. So again, it doesn't look like I've potted it up, but I really have, um, and that's plenty. And hopefully that will grow into the pot. And again, just for plain rainwater for two months and then start feeding after that. Okay, um, we do get a few odd pests and diseases with um, orchids. Um, the main one being most indoor plants is mealybug, which is the little tiny white little bugs you see. It looks like basically um, candy floss, I guess, tiny little bit. Um, it's really common, especially in the summer. Um, it gets hot and they all just pop out of nowhere. They do live in the soil, um, so sometimes um, you can see it sort of gradually building up onto the flowers um, and usually sort of behind the flowers being quite sneaky and you don't see it until it's a little bit late. But anyway, um, that is quite easily controlled. You just wipe it off with um, a damp cloth or a cotton bud and then just use a um, just any sort of bug killer basically. I um, can't show you what this one is but it's basically what you buy in any garden centre, um, just uh, all purpose basically. Um, that does everything from um, Green fly, um, what else? Scale. Scale is quite um, prolific on the cymbidiums. And um, basically, it goes onto the underleaf underneath. Um, so, again, it's, it's sneaky, it creeps up on you, and you don't see it, and then you're like, oh, that's a lot there. <laughs> anyway, take it off. You can basically take it off with your finger and a damp cloth, and then just apply, apply the bug spray. Um, other things, um, green fly. Red spider mite, um, that is um, quite a funny one. You get like dark marks on your leaves um, and on the underside and on the top side. Um, but again, this will do it. Um, they, it spray it every two weeks until you're, um, until you're up to your maximum dosage um, and that should really help. Um, just keep an eye on your plants basically before it's a little bit late um, and especially this top time of year when things start to come out. Um, but yeah, that's it really. Uh, right, we can grow things in different composts. I mean, compost is really only there to hold the plant in situ, hold some moisture, hold or even give some feed. So if it's an organic compost, then of course, it's, as, it, as the um, constituent parts rot down, it actually creates feed. I mean, that's what a compost does. That's what compost is. Um, and you've got to get the right compost for the right plant because obviously the plants in the ground, the things that Ellis just potted there, are terrestrial plants. That's why we've still got a, a much closer mix here. Yeah? But a lot of orchids are epiphytes, i.e. they grow up trees, um, especially these things. And of course, they would never ever be tight around the root. There would always be lots of air around the root, something up a tree. I mean, as I said before, it's 20 foot up a tree. So it never sit there with wet roots. So we tend to grow these in just bark. What this is uh, cross-cut pine bark, okay? Bark is not a compost. Bark is the edge of a tree, yeah? That's all it is. But of course, that's how the plant naturally grows. They sort of cling themselves to the bark. Um, the only thing about bark, of course, it does have chemicals in there. Um, you know, we, we tan leather by using, well, we used to tan leather by using bark. Uh, like it was oak bark, but this is pine bark. But the same thing, if you're growing in bark, that must never sit wet. Um, if you sit this in a, your plant in a saucer with too much moisture, the, um, the chemicals can seep from the bark and can make a sort of a toxic soup and kill off your roots. So if you're in bark, make sure you've got good drainage. And again, these things, I say, will be right up the tree, so they'll never sit wet. This plant, to be honest, could stay in here for another year. You can see the root growth. It's absolutely fine. The spike was cut down, as we've already mentioned, to that third node. One, two, three. So they'll branch out from there. So this is the time to do it now. Um, sort of spring, early summer time. Get these potted. And um, it's just knock it out to it looks like. There you go. So you've got a perfectly healthy root system. That could be, it's probably not quite big enough. You could just drop up a size. Go into that size pot. And just infill with a bit more bar. Um, more often than not, though, you're going to knock these out. Oh, it's usually good for about two or three years, but then the roots will start to decay, or the compost itself starts to decay. So these roots will actually be soft and squadgy. If that's the case, you've got to cut all those roots off. You can't leave dead roots in, um, in, a, in a potted plant. It's like a, a bad apple, you know, it just turns all the, all the other roots off. 
Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to assume that these roots have actually died. Uh, um, and you can tell them because they're just squadgy. These are completely firm at the moment, so what? But let's do on the assumption that they're, they're actually squadgy. And you just gently bash off all the compost. There we go. So there we go. And you'll often find with these, they're started off with a little small peat block in the centre. Okay. So you don't want to keep too much root when you pot. It's best to prune a bit. And what I tend to do is to take out the centre of the there, which is the oldest roots. You just take that out, you'll find you take a little, little batch of root with you. Um, and often the centre ones have a slightly orange tinge to them. And you want it to get a nice clear root system. And we're going back into the small pot. We always pot into the smallest pot you can get them into within reason, that is. Things that Eddie's just divided, they look stupidly small, but they're much happier. So I'm going to put that into there, and you can see there's not a lot of room, but they're much happier being confined within the pot. So we're just going to backfill with a bit of this bark. Now obviously there's no nutrient in this whatsoever. So we tend to pot, leave it a month or two to establish, and then you can start feeding with the orchid feed. Um, you don't have to go mad about this. The idea is that you want to get some air spaces within the pot because again that's how the plant would naturally be. We don't do that old fashioned, you know, you just pot and ram things solid so you can pick the plant up without the pot falling out. Those days have all changed, I'm afraid. Yeah, just lightly like that. And as the roots start forming, you will actually tighten up in the pot. And we pot just so the, the base of the plant is sitting at the pot level. Yeah. If you pot too deep, you get rots. We've already mentioned about getting water in the centre here. Well, the same thing with if you pot too deep, you don't want anything to, to make that wet because it will just rot through. So that will root through with new roots probably within about a month or so this time of year and absolutely romp off. You can grow orchids in lots of things, to be honest. Um, you can see Nelly's just been using the peat mix. Um, we have the um, a moss mix, which we'll do in a minute. Um, but I've also got down here, uh, this is a cymbidium, and this is just to prove my point. This is a cymbidium grown in um, beer bottle tops, yeah. And so I had to empty all these bottles, unfortunately, it was hell to do, but it just shows you can grow in virtually anything. The compost is almost secondary, it's what you do with the plant in that compost is the important bit. Get the watering right, your humidity right, the nutrients right, you could grow in, I don't know cut up shoes or whatever, you know, it's just getting that the right system going so that the plant's got the water and the available nutrients, but in a, an amount it can cope with. You, know, you don't want it to be too hot, too dry, whatever. So there we go, pretty tough stuff. Um, I'll just show you the moss mix and we'll do a um, an oncidium. Okay, next I'm going to pop one of these oncidiums or odontoglossums as we call them. In this case, we're going to use a moss mix. This is moss, bark and perlite. Um, this is because it's what they naturally grow in. Um, they just love this sort of combination of moss. Um, it's brilliant stuff. It's got its own penicillium in it, sagna moss. Um, they used to use it as uh, field dressing in the First World War, apparently. So if you've got any plants with any problems, stick them in some moss. It looks after it. So this plant has already been grown in it. You can see it's a lovely root system. Um, the only thing about this stuff is it does deteriorate. So every sort of fourth year or so, you might have to strip the plant out and completely start again. So I just put a little bit at the bottom, stick your plant in. Again, tiny, literally only feel about an inch gap between the, the root ball and the new pot. We just gently fold a bit in. Again, don't press it down because it will swell up um, as it gets down. There we go, so that will sit there. So that should be good for at least another couple of years, to be honest. So water that in. Again, we'll just rain water. We won't use any feed on that for a couple of months, by which time it will establish a root system, then you feed. There's no point feeding too early. Um, if the plant hasn't got the roots there to take up the, the nutrients, it just goes sour. Yeah, so it's better to do it very, very gradually. Wait, say eight weeks or so, let the roots appear, then you start introducing the feed. Um, all orchids are so slow growing. You know, that plant is now one, two, three, four, five, six, eight years old. So they, they've, 
and all orchids tend to be slow growing. So this is why we do everything is slowed down a bit. This is why we use very barren compost. This is why we use rainwater rather than tap water. This is why we use orchid feed, which to be honest is only about a third of the strength of a pot plant feed. We have to tailor everything down to their metabolic rate in effect. Um, but once you've got an established plant, it should flower every year. Apart from where obviously Ellie was cutting some plants up, you may have to a year for them to recover from that, and then they should start again. But they go on forever. You know, orchids, um, you know, they can be left as a legacy. We have people bring in plants that have been left to them, and left to the generation before that. So you, you buy an orchid for life, in effect. You know, they just keep on going, they really do. Um, let me just a little talk about greenhouses. I, I started in 1971 at the Beans. And we were still using some of the old Victorian greenhouses. So they're um, just as a house we're in now, it's sort of brick up to about a metre or so. And then they had cedar wood tops on them, hand crank vents, there was no electricity in them. They all had um, big water vats within the house themselves. It collected all the water off the roof, went into the individual house because it was originally, it would have been watered by a watering can. They had um, pot boys, they called it, just dipped a pot, took it to the grower, watered the plant. Um, and they were lovely orchid houses, they were beautiful, these great big six inch um, pipes for heating, so you had a, a bigger volume but a lesser temperature. Um, they were a lot shadier than modern greenhouses, um, which again, especially the last few years, it's been, it, they've been very, very bright summers. Um, we're in an Alitex house here now, you can see we've got the screens on the outside. Well that's just copying an old Victorian system of last blinds. They used to roll up and down the sides of, of greenhouses every day. Um, they've got continuous vents. Um, again, this, this whole ridge vent here from this Alitex house gives you a lot more vent than we used to have. Um, so everything's going almost back to it was. You know, the Victorians sorted all this out. They thought about the whole thing. And now it's been picked up, especially in these houses. You can see we've got side vents here. Well, some of the old Victorian houses had side vents actually put in the brickwork. So you could get a natural convection would come through the brickwork, up through your plants and out through the roof in the summertime. Well, we've got it here, it's all come back, it all comes around, you know. So, siting of the greenhouses, the orchid houses were always sort of sited north-south. So you'd have a morning side and an afternoon side in effect, because most other growers run east-west. So you'd have that sun all the morning, right through the day into the evening on your big flat south side. But orchids, we don't want that. We don't want too much heat in the summer. There's no orchids we grow that have full light in the summer. Everything will be shaded through the summertime. So that's why the old fashioned north south was done that you would put the blinds on the east side in the morning, midday, you would take those off, and then you put the west side on. So you'd almost like have two houses within, within one house. Um, so it's worth thinking about if you're going to side it. You just try and avoid that midday sun. But these things are amazing. You know, they they're vastly overbuilt. I mean, you can land an aeroplane on these Alitex houses, to be perfectly honest. Um, but they're just, they've gone back to originally, you know, just the thought of how you grow something and make it easy to grow. Um, it's, I say late, late, it's been a real struggle getting through the summers. Um, to, to heat a greenhouse up is quite easy, but to cool it down in the summer is a real problem. Hence, you're getting these, these reflective blinds on the outside. So um, just think about it. It's much easier to grow a lot of plants than just one or two. Yeah, you can grow 100 plants easier than 10. You can grow 10 easier than one because you get that microclimate. Um, in here again, we've got these benches with this hydraulica, um, which you just squirt water on. And it keeps the humidity up. We like to run at about 65, 70% humidity. Your house is gonna be about 10 to 20% humidity. Especially in the sun, in the winter, you've got radiators burning, it's very dry atmosphere. So in a house, maybe just stand them on a little tray with some of this hydraulic and just, just to get that background humidity up. So if orchids are plants at the end of the day, they're just plants with a fancy name. Yeah. They're long-lived plants, so they should outlive you, no problem at all. I so say we've got plants, I think about 126 years old now. Um, so it's just a matter of getting the, the, the atmosphere right, just getting the humidity right, the light levels right, the watering right, the feed levels right, and they're no more difficult than any other plant, to be honest. Um, we get a little bit of pests and disease. Um, Ellie will talk to you about that in a second. But orchids are so tough. They're much, much tougher than other plants.